for this one brave person here. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a... <laughs> He's an expert. Yeah. Okay, cool. Look, uh, folks, we're going to have some fun today. Um, this is an exciting session we're talking about Kubernetes. And uh, a lot of folks in the room are excited about this technology. A lot of our customers are using Kubernetes today. We're very proud to have Marcin Kuber here today from News UK. Now, Marcin, we're going to talk about your experience with Kubernetes. We're going to talk about some best practices, how you built a successful Kubernetes platform. But before we do that, let's do quick introductions. Um, so first of all, my name is Stan Polfleet. I am tech evangelist at New Relic. I'm based out of Barcelona. Now, what is good to know is all the goodness for our Kubernetes monitoring and, in, and New Relic infrastructure is actually being developed in Barcelona. So we're very close to all of you. Well, nice to know. Um, Marcy, now before we jump into some of these interesting things we're going to talk about, tell a little bit about yourself and your company, please. Well, I'm Marcin Kuba. I'm a DevOps engineer, and I specialize in cloud-native technologies. Um, I work for News UK. News UK is part of a wider company, which is News Corporation, which specializes in kind of media. They distribute and kind of write massive stories globally. Um, News UK itself is a proud owner of brands such as The Times, The Sun, and TLS. That's impressive. I mean, The Sun, The Times, those are big brands. And of course, when you, your organization is responsible for a big brand like that, how do you maintain such a high quality? How do you make sure that you have a flawless end user experience? Uh, can you well, talk about that? Yes, exactly. So uh, we want to kind of distribute globally all the news and as soon as possible. And we want to provide real time updates. Should we switch to the next slide? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the first challenge we were facing is scalability. If there is a break in news, for example, we want every reader to be able to get a real time updates worldwide and of course to have a flawless experience. Our next challenge is around kind of speed of innovation. We want to deliver best capabilities, the best user experiences. And finally, cost efficiency. We want to run our infrastructure at the lowest possible price while still delivering our objectives. Some big challenges, I mean, continuously innovating, cost efficiency, that's serious. Now, where does Kubernetes come into play and why is Kubernetes important for you? So first, Kubernetes allows us to easily scale. We can scale up our environment in cloud when number of readers increases, but there is more. It gives us portability. We can, it enables uh, us to deploy faster because a container is so quickly deployed and up and running. Let me also share a softer benefit. Kubernetes is open source and this is sexy. We want to attract modern engineers that care about cloud native technologies. And on top of that, we want to take advantage of the vast ecosystem of other open source tools that have been designed specifically to work with Kubernetes. I'm going to remember this one. Uh, Kubernetes is sexy. I, I just like us. Uh, just Modern like, engineers. Like us on stage, exactly. Um, so I think the benefits of Kubernetes are clear. I think that's why we're all so excited about it, you know, the portability, scalability, et cetera. But one of the questions that we often ask ourselves then is, do I completely manage Kubernetes myself, or do I leverage maybe any of the cloud providers that offer a managed Kubernetes service? So AWS provides multiple solutions to, con to run containers. We have EKS, ECS, Fargate. We also have AWS Batch and the Elastic Beanstar as well. We decided to go for a Elastic Kubernetes service because it provides us with a managed uh, control plane from AWS. Uh, operationally, this simplifies what we have to maintain and monitor. On top of that, we have EKS running in its own VPC, isolated VPC, allowing us to specify our own security groups and network access control lists. Um, this provides us with a high level of isolation and helps us build highly secure and reliable applications. Um, with EKS, we make use of IAM users and roles to authenticate with the API server and to configure fine-grained access to any Kubernetes namespace. Makes sense. I mean. AWS makes your life easier. You don't have to worry about some of these yeah. difficult challenges of managing your control plane, master nodes, etc. Updates are easier. I, I get that. Um, now, you mentioned earlier that deploying software, innovating quickly is very important. Did you have to do anything to accomplish that within a AKS? Or? We want to enable teams to iterate fast. So one of the challenges was how can we automatically update our worker nodes? 
Currently, as you guys know, whoever is using EKS, it's not supported. So the way we accomplished this was by using CloudFormation for our worker nodes. That gives us an option to perform a rolling update on the worker nodes itself. Then we have a lifecycle hook, which kind of marks an instance that's going to be terminated. And at that point, we have a Lambda function, which detects those events and gracefully drains the nodes before it gets terminated. OK, cool. So now you have an environment. It automatically updates. You can easily scale to handle the load, to handle more customers, et cetera. One question that comes up now is, you know, if you easily scale, how do you keep control of cost? Well, cost is an important aspect everywhere. Uh, we spot instances for all our AKS clusters. For those who are not familiar with this, EC2 spot instances allow you to purchase a free unused, well, not free, unused spare compute capacity. And um, there's a huge advantage of using uh, spot instances. We are making around 70% savings when comparing to on-demand pricing. And however, in order to use spot instances, we had to ensure that our cluster can scale fast and that the workloads are fully working. And because AWS can claim back AWS test the spot instances at any time, we had to ensure that during interruptions, we are draining the nodes before they get taken away from us. For that purpose, we defined or designed our own daemon set, our own application that detects the termination signal and then drains gracefully the node before it gets terminated. Impressive cost savings. I mean, 70% cost savings in, in your case. Um, yeah. uh, using spot instances seems very interesting, but I think it's, it's important for the audience to acknowledge that, hey, yeah. there is more to do. You need to make sure that you handle how these machines are being interrupted, how these instances are being interrupted. So if people want to know more about this after the session, please come and talk to, to Marcin. Now, Marcin, um, automatically scaling, making sure, you know, that we understand what's happening, we're re reducing costs. How do you understand what the current capacity is of your cluster? And how do you keep control over the capacity if multiple teams are trying to build and deploy applications? So for that reason, we make use of resource quarters. So all our namespaces uh, use resource quarters and by defining at least CPU and memory that can be consumed. When multiple users or teams share a cluster with a fixed number of nodes, there's a concern that one team could occupy more than its fair share of resources, and resource quarters are there to address this concern. At the namespace level, we also want to guarantee that one pod or container does not consume all of the resources within the namespace, and for that reason, we have resource limits at the pod level. Yeah, resource requests, resource limits are very important. Uh, we, I see a lot of customers using them. The cool thing is that we can actually also help our customers in the New Relic platform to track against those resource limits and resource requests. It's, it's really important. Now, um, what about security? So security is always an important concern. So by default, any new namespace that we create uh, uses denying all access network policy. Just a note, I don't think it's actually mentioned, but to make use of network policies, you have to have Calico installed. But that's off the topic. Um, yeah. Um, Teams are responsible for defining their own egress and ingress roles. And for cluster administrators, it is also essential to make use of pod security policies. Such policies allow you to define a set of conditions that all pods must meet in order to be accepted into the namespace and effectively into the system. Very cool. Um, so, of course, we want to talk a little bit about New Relic as well, right? Um, so, you shared some great insights, um, but how is New Relic helping you to understand what's happening in your Kubernetes environment? Well, we use um, New Relic Cluster Explorer for all our e EKS to monitor the state of nodes and workloads. We also make use of alerts and, and to, to get notified when something is not working as expected. This is applicable to both infrastructure and pods running inside the cluster. On top of that, we are sending all of the Kubernetes logs and events, which is a new functionality to store everything in a single centralized place where it's easily accessible to all of the developers if they, if they ever have to see it. Awesome. Let, let's pause here for a minute. Uh, let's have a look at our, our dashboard here. So I think this, is sh this was shown earlier today, but uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time. What are we seeing here? So this is a view of a Kubernetes cluster. Now, in this Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster, we have nine nodes. Each slice of our K Kubernetes Cluster Explorer represents one node in the cluster. Now, what we also see are these small hexagons. Each hexagon represents a pod in my cluster. Now, what we see is there are these pods that are marked in orange or red. So this means that something is going wrong. 
something is happening. If a pod is in the inner circle, it means that it is stuck in the pending state. So when a pod in the pending state, for example, can mean that there were not enough resources available in the cluster to schedule your pod. Now, what if something else is going on? What you can actually do is you can drill down on any of these pods here. If you click on any of these pods, you get a side pane. And this gives you much more information about what's going on with your pod, with your container, and the application running inside. So for example, what we see here is I clicked on a specific pod, and I can see it's part of this namespace, part of this deployment, and it's running on this node. What's interesting is I can see how many resources this pod is consuming. And we talked about resource requests, resource limits earlier, so we can actually track against those resource limits. So the blue line here represents our actual resource consumption, <coughs> while the yellow line represents my requested resource, and the red line represents the limit. So in this case, we can actually see that this pod is running very close to its memory limit. And that's also why it's marked in red here. Cool? Now, looking at the infrastructure at resource consumption is one thing. But the big value is if you can correlate your Kubernetes cluster with your application performance. And that's also what we're seeing here. So at the bottom of this container side pane, we get performance metrics of the application service running inside this pod. So we can see what is the transaction time or latency, what is throughput, and what about error rates. So this is purely gold. You have the context of your application performance in the Kubernetes Cluster Explorer. But of course, we want to take this one step further. We've announced logging recently. It is now really easy to push log files from your Kubernetes cluster to the New Relic platform. It's only one click away. So you don't have to switch anymore between tools. You don't have to go to a Kibana, to a Splunk, whatever. <laughs> you can stay right within the New Relic platform. One click from within the container side pane, and we immediately show you the correct log file for that container. This is gold, and it is saving a lot of time for our customers. So if you haven't tried this out, please talk to your New Relic account managers and go ahead and figure this out. We're, of course, there to help you. So, OK, where did we leave off? So, uh, Martin, we learned some great things already. Um, here in the audience, we're all here to make our Kubernetes environments better. Are there some other recommendations you can share with the audience? Um, absolutely. So the recommendations I have are very simple. I would always encourage to make the old Docker images as small as possible and to run stateless applications with your Kubernetes. Don't run databases in them. I've, I've heard people are doing it. And this would improve your scalability and portability. Set up health checks for your applications so, so that pods that are running healthy can be validated. And lastly, I strongly recommend using IAM roles to deploy anything. This way, you can utilize temporary credentials that will expire soon after your deployment, and you never have to worry about static, not rotated credentials. Cool. So another great set of best practices, recommendations. We want to make sure that our Kubernetes environment is agile, swift, so we want to use small Docker images. Totally makes sense. Health checks is an interesting one. Uh, I see a lot of customers using readiness probes and liveness probes, and this is very important. We have just announced a private beta of Kubernetes events, and these Kubernetes events actually give great visibility into these health checks, because you want to know when a health check is failing, right? So we're now automatically picking up these failing liveness probes and showing you what's happening all in the context of the Kubernetes Cluster Explorer. So that's great. Now, Martin, um, we learned great things. Um, we've saw, we saw a lot of things you've been doing at News UK. What's next for News UK? So the next step would be to implement a service discovery solution. We're considering only two options, which is Istio or AppMesh. Personally, I believe it would be much more suitable for us to use AppMesh since we are heavily relying on other AWS services. However, Istio will also be tested, and then we can verify which is a better solution. So the benefits are clear. By default, service discovery should make it easier for two apps to communicate with each other. However, the features we're looking at are metering and usage caps. OK, so service discovery, service mesh, that's a big theme for, for you coming up. Great. Um, Martin, where uh, can people learn a bit more? 
So you can find me definitely on Medium. I have some nice stories, and I actually have a very popular story recently, which is on the open IDC provider for where you can use IAM roles for your service accounts. Ensure that you want to read it, because AWS docs are not great. Um, <laughs> It works quite well. Uh, you can drop your cube to IAM and the key IAM weird implementations. Um, this is my GitHub repository as well, where I've posted some of the Terraform modules that I've written for EKS. It's not really a module, it's a set of templates. And obviously, my LinkedIn. You can get in touch if you have any questions. Great. Thanks for Thank sharing. Uh, we were thinking of taking some questions from the audience, but we're running a bit behind. So Marcin, yeah. please, a big round of applause for Marcin. Thank you.